All right, got some people joining us, which is very exciting. So we'll just give it another minute, Damien, and then we'll kick off. Excellent. Yeah, so for everyone joining us this morning, if you can uh, we'll get some engagement right off the bat and if you can please let us know if you've ever used an LMS, either as a learner or to learn something new or as a business leader. Oh, Dan, thank you. As a student, that's a good one too. Both ends of the scale. Thank you. We've got some good responses coming through. Oh, Vic, it sounds like you could be taking this session. Right, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. You use it as a student teacher and creating content. That's great. Righty, should we kick off, Damien? Let's do it. All right, awesome. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name's Katie. I'm the head of business development for Vetasys and eWorks. It's, uh, it's great to be here today and I'm joined by Damien. Um, so Damien is the CEO of HR Central. Damien, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and your business? Oh, thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah, HR Central's been around for eight years. We, we saw a need, particularly in small business, where um, they don't necessarily have HR staff as part of their small teams uh, as a way to service that need uh, using technology and, and real life humans that people could call and, and email to get support and advice from. Uh, as I said, we started about eight years ago. Uh, we now look after uh, nearly 1,500 businesses around the country. Wow, keeping you busy, Damien. Absolutely. Um, uh, I've got an amazing team, so I'm very fortunate. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. Um, and to those tuned in today, um, it'd be great to know who we've got in the audience. So if you can pop, uh, pop, pop in the chat your name and organisation um, and what has piqued your interest about the session this morning. Um, if anyone does have any questions that they want answered throughout the session, please put them in the Q&A section just so that they stand out to us. That would be great. Righty-o. So um, before jumping on or off the LMS um, and e-learning uh, bandwagon, it'd be great to, um, to hear about some of the challenges our audience is facing with their internal training. Um, so we really want to talk today about the current challenges um, and the latest trends for um, organizations that are considered small to medium businesses. Uh, that's why we're here today. Um, so that, that means businesses generally with under 100 staff. Um, many um, in this bracket even have under 20 staff. So, um, so Damien, I know that this is quite a lot of your target market so, um, and your client base. So what are some of the challenges that you've been seeing with your clients in your world? One of the biggest ones, Katie, at the moment is cost. Um, the the increase in wages is going to take effect from the first pay cycle after July 1. 5.75% is going to increase that, those costs as well, plus half a percent uh, for super as well. So small businesses are looking at costs. So even before they look at training over the whole and how do they deliver it, um, how much is it going to cost? So that's a, that's a really big thing we're seeing in small business. Everyone knows cost of living pressures, uh, interest rate issues, uh, and now this increase in, in wages. So Particularly in small business land, um, this is a this is a big factor. Um, and and now with hybrid work and and people sometimes in the office and sometimes maybe working from home and not having that continuity of people in in, in one place, um, trying to get the continuity of of training uh, for all the different people in the business, regardless of where they are, that's a real challenge. It definitely is, Damien. Yeah. yeah, I think it's um it's definitely something that everyone it's affecting everyone. It's something that we're all in Australia, so we're all in it together. Um, is there anything else that's really jumping out as a trend in your world? Well, I think probably the place where this is um, 
the most pertinent for small businesses is in, is in onboarding and, and induction and that, that initial training. Um, I know during COVID, for those of you in Melbourne, uh, when, when things were fully locked down, people starting um, starting at a new business, um, they got a new logo at the bottom of their email, uh, but they didn't necessarily have the induction. They weren't on site. They didn't necessarily get to meet their team. Um, so how businesses onboarded and, and brought people in and really got them engaged with the, with the, the company and the brand and the culture um, made a big difference with retention rates. I know some businesses that didn't really invest in that, they had a real struggle with people leaving after 12 months because if you're working from your home office or your bedroom or wherever it might be um, and you're, I don't know, selling insurance or working in superannuation or whatever it might be, to switch to another company is is no change than other to the bottom of the logo. And if you can get a 10% increase in your wage or an extra few thousand dollars or whatever it might be to switch, what's the incentive to stay with that organisation? So making that time and effort and investment in new hires to really bed them down in the business is really important. Um, if you spend the money to recruit, which we know, again, at the moment, it's hard to find good people, uh, hard, as, hard as ever. Um, the, the investment that you make on the recruitment side, if you're not backing that up with an investment in the induction and onboarding and, and um, sort of gluing that person to your, to your company, it's actually a really big loss uh, down the track. So um, with the hybrid workforce again and, and remote learning and remote teaching uh, and remote training uh, has really come to the fore to make sure it's equitable across everyone, whether they're in the office or, or um, remote. Yeah, thanks, Damien. I think um, it's also quite a manual process for a lot of small businesses, um, especially the um, a lot of our customers that are coming to us. Um, they're actually quite surprised with how much an, uh, a learning management system or LMS costs, and that can save quite um, quite a lot of time and and money in training people and knowing exactly where everyone's um, at in their induction process. Um, so. Yeah, there's been a lot of change in this space. Um, so a, a lot of people also think that LMS is really expensive um, and they're quite surprised by how much it can cost. So that leads me to my next question um, to the audience. So um, I'd love to know what everyone thinks the real cost of setting up an LMS would be for up to 200 users. Um, so if everyone can pop in their chat, whether they think it would be A, B, C, or D. So A, under 5,000, B, under 10, or C, over 15,000. That well, would be while great. While everyone's doing that, Katie, I think one of, the, mm. one of the key things that we've seen is the ability to collate results. Mm -hmm. So rather than having manual processes where you then have to manually punch a result somewhere, um, having the ability to have that centralised from the get-go, as soon as the answers are in, they're already in that and you have that reporting overlay. It's, it's making a big difference for time. So people Absolutely. look at this training and, and this investment in, in onboarding and induction and, and expectation setting, and they're like, oh, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort. But once you take time and effort to set it up once, you can repeat for each new hire, uh, and then the results will drop into the same um, system to then report on. It actually becomes quite streamlined, and the time and effort per hire is really, really reduced. So a little bit of effort up the front saves a lot of time down the track. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. we've got um, a few responses in here. Joanne, I am talking about including the cost of ongoing support here. Um, so the answer is actually um, A. So what uh, what we're looking at um, is, for, yeah, so for up to 200 users, uh, it does cost less than $5,000 to set up and run an LMS for 12 months. Um, well, that that is through us. There's obviously a lot of options for upgrades and all those sorts of things. It depends on your actual situation. But for under $5,000, you can get a custom themed LMS with your corporate branding. You can get online uh, access to an online support portal, um, including an administrator portal and a knowledge base. Uh, we've also got a variety of plugins available to tailor the LMS to your needs, virtual training sessions, and also basic reporting. So um, it, it is not as expensive as uh, as it might be for a basic setup. Um, that does bring me, oh Vic, it is it is limited features. It depends what, what you're looking for, but it is a good starting point uh, for those smaller businesses who are just looking for basics. Um, I think also, Katie, sorry to jump in, but, but right. when you do that, when you do that initial setup, tweaking that, uh, content to overlay your culture is really important. 
So how are you differentiating yourself? Yes, it's great to have the core modules that everyone needs to have, but how can you overlay your, your culture, uh, even in dress from the, the, the owner or the CEO or the general manager or something like that? Um, if, you can, um, if you can spend some time to really embed that, that's going to be a differentiator. And that's, people are going to say, well, this is the brand I work for. This is the company I work for. This is what they stand for. And then people are more tight. That, you know, if you can couple that with good team unity and, and team programs to engage people on a personal level with their colleagues um, and then a, and a, an attachment to the brand, that's how you retain people. And, and retaining good people is really important. Absolutely. I think it also is starting, um, it's part of starting a new business as well. It, it makes it feel like you're professional and you're part of an organisation that's organised. Um, so that can really make a difference to the onboarding process. Um, and at least you've got some consistency with all of the staff that you're bringing on board too. Um, yeah, and your and your 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 hire who's coming into a smaller business than than say a multinational feels, hey, look at this, these guys are sharp. They, you know, they know what they're doing. They, they're offering some value. I feel, you know, like a lot of care for me as an employee. And that's what you want. When it's it's a new experience. It can be a great first day, or it can be an awful first day. You know, you hear the horror stories of people rocking up for their first day, and there's no computer there or their desk is empty or whatever it might be. That's horrific. Whereas you can spin this all on its head, even if they're remote, and, and give them a really good experience and a really good welcome. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Um, so let's have a chat about some of the latest trends in e-learning. Um, if anyone's got any trends that they're seeing and want to share, please also pop them into the chat. But Damien, I'd love to hear some of the trends that you've been seeing with your clients. Yeah, well, the flexibility in the delivery is the key. The, the, the top one now, as we spoke about um, earlier, that this is number one. So how can you make it suitable and convenient for your team to do this? And wherever possible, um, doing it in your own time or not in your own time, like not your personal time, but in, at the time it suits and on the device it suits, that's ideal. So whether people are on desktops or they're mobile, they're working in, in co-working spaces or they're working in cafes even, maybe they're doing it on their uh, tablet or they're doing it even on their phone, um, making that accessible and available is helping people get the job done. So we're seeing actual execution and um, completion increase where the ability for people to do it the way they want to do it is increasing. So that's a, that's a big one for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, yeah. Damo. Um, there you go, Damo. Uh, we, we've we also seen, obviously, a lot of change in the AI and AI space. Chat GPT is obviously a very hot topic. We're all not sure what it is. And, um, and I mean, I'm sure we could easily have a whole session just around the chat GPT and AI space. I'm definitely not an expert here. Um, but one, one thing that is really jumping out um, at me, having worked in the TAFE and higher education space for the last few years, um, there's a lot of um, movement towards virtual reality training, which I think has been really um, interesting and exciting. So there's been um, a lot of training that's been developed to take risky work uh, work practices out of the training. So it might be things like welding or operating heavy machinery is being um, created on like one of those virtual reality headsets um, so that people can eliminate the risk when teaching the theory and letting students um, have a go at doing things without having to do it in the risky environment. So that's been really interesting. Um, we've also seen the emergence of flipped learning models. So um, that what that means is it might be instead of uh, teaching people theory and and having them learn the theory and then going into the answers, it's um, actually starting the learning with uh, situational questions that direct students through um, a scenario with branching questions. So that way managers can see how people would respond initially to a situation and then talk about this is actually correct because or this this is actually how we we do things around here and setting yeah. setting those expectations. Yeah, I've seen, Katie, even some people using um, animations or pictures to set a scene. So here's the situation, and now this happens. What do you do? So it's not just uh, setting a scene verbally or through text, also using imagery to, to set a scene and say, if you see this, what do you do? So it's exactly. yeah, a really good way. The, learning, the flip learning model spins it on its head. It's not just Q&A not just boring rote learning it's, it's actually situational it's it's a uh, it's a great way to cut through yeah and I think when you're developing content or choosing content um 
you, the images that you choose really can represent your brand, um, whether you're a bit more of a fun and funky brand, like you mentioned about having some cartoons, sort of that more laid back sort of situation, or whether you are a bit more corporate and wanting those more the corporate feel. Um, that can really come out when you're developing your content. Um, so one other thing that we're seeing uh, a lot at the moment, and this is also another very hot topic, um, is micro-learning, micro-credentials, skill sets. Um, so micro-credentials and skill sets uh, for, sorry, micro-learning and micro-credentials um, are instead of basically having huge units of competency, there's specific skill set clusters that are being developed and assessed, um, making the training a lot more bite-sized. So it, it helps when you're wanting to upskill your staff um, and you're wanting to get your learn the learners buy-in because it's not such a big chunk of information that they're having to digest. Have you heard much about that, Damien, in your space? Yeah, I have. And it's, it's sort of, I think, been led in a lot of ways by some online tools that are out there. Like LinkedIn's got a great learning environment in, inside it um, where you can really really like specify what, what is the actual outcome I'm looking for. And it may just be one skill. It's not even a whole industry. It's just a skill uh, to add to your existing skill set. Um, and what we've seen um, recently come out, some of the universities around the country are now offering these micro-credentials where there's a, there's a lack of these skills in the industry. But we know Future Work says, if it's not here already, these, these credentials and these skills are going to be needed in the short term just, just to do the jobs that are out there. So just picking those things that are just a little bit outside what people have got skills in uh, to upgrade what they have and, and, and their use uh, to meet what the requirements are and what the needs are uh, in the industry. I think also um, from a from a life point of view, people are snacking everywhere. Right? People don't read, well, not, not all people, many people don't read books anymore, right? They, they snack with their information. They read the, the headlines of news sites or they read social media for five minutes. They want to bite size, everything's bite size, give me a little bit now and I'll move it on to the next thing. So this is a really good way to engage people and say, instead of doing a, an MBA that's going to take X number of years part-time around your full-time course, uh, your full-time job, hey, go and get one of these or go and get three of these uh, in a short amount of time, but really um, specific to what you want to learn and, and what's going to put you in a good position with your career going forward. It's true. And I think um, obviously going back to that whole I, um, conversation earlier about money being a factor in all of our lives at the moment I think people there's a real appetite for people to be able to do learning in their own time outside of work hours um, so that's where um, micro learning micro credentials can really come into um, to be a really great way of people wanting to upskill in certain areas and we're also finding there's been quite a lot of um, conversations around digital budgeting that's some work that we've also been doing um, within our team here so um, that's all, there's also an appetite for people to be able to put their qualifications on their LinkedIn profiles and and sharing their qualifications in different ways than we've ever seen before um, I think gone are the days of just having a physical certificate people are wanting those digital copies too so um, that's been a really interesting space and interesting trend that we've been we've been seeing. Um, we've also seen a really big desire within uh, our client base to be able to develop their own content and to be able to have the tools and the accessibility to make the changes that they want to their content, make the changes that they want to their LMS and be able to do their own reporting. So there is really that um, desire for people to be able to manage things themselves. I think that's definitely a bit of an appetite from a small business point of view where they're used to having that hands-on manual process of tracking everything. Um, so, yeah, that's that's been a really interesting space to look at. And um, we're actually going, our next webinar in July is going to be around um, content development. So that'll be exciting. Um, I think I'd they, oh, sorry, sorry go. In there. I, think, I think the key thing again here is differentiation. How, how are you making your business and your team uh, and your company overall stand out as a, as a great employer? And again, that, that ability to modify the content to suit the tone and the language that's used in your business is going to help educate your new hire in particular or your current team and just remind them, this is how we roll. Like, this is, this is the, the undercurrent of our business. And this is one of the reasons why we like working here. 
because this is how we this is how we speak or this is our tone and it's fit for purpose. Now it can be totally different. Like you said, it could be that um, humorous or the the fun sort of methodology, or it can be that corporate. But whatever it is, it's fit for purpose, and that's that's what that employee is expecting from that organisation. And the more you can reiterate that and continue to to tweak it and and refine it um, to continue to sell your message as an organisation, the more your employee sees it, and the and the better um, engaged they're going to be with it because it, it it fits. Right? Sometimes off the shelf stuff. It's like if you're a, if you're a fun cheeky business with a with a sort of a cheeky marketing approach and a cheeky brand, if you put a corporate um, heavy lifting video in front of, they're like, what the hell? This is not how we would roll. So yeah, really important. Yeah, I think um, there's been quite a lot of content that I've seen also that's been developed from overseas. So it might be really American or really British. I'm not. I'm not sure, but you know, sometimes that really doesn't fit into a, a small business in regional Victoria. Like that. That is not the their staff base. That is not representation um, of their employees or the culture. So um, I guess that's something to keep in mind when you are looking at off the shelf content. Yeah, um, employees are smart enough. Like they, they know. Absolutely. They know if it's from somewhere else, they're not, they're not silly. They, they, they get onto it and, and you can use it. As, it could be a really big positive or it could be a negative. You know, yeah, totally. So yeah, yeah, worth it. Worth the investment. Absolutely. Um, I have popped in there a book recommendation, though. Obviously, um, there's been quite a few comments about AI um, in in the chat um, and and chat GPT. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend the ITECA conference last week, um, and Dr. Stefan Poppin. Popanici um, presented on um, AI chat GPT and um, and he's got a really good book that I thought um, might be uh, of interest to some people who are interested in uh, looking at the AI space and reading a bit more about it. Um, so did he write it? Did he write it using chat GPT? He no, he it's actually very interesting. Um, he's he did not write it using chat GPT and. Um, he has got a lot of um, different perspectives of how it's used and um, how it should be used. Um, so, yeah, definitely interesting. I'm not going to summarise his work because um, I haven't got through the book yet, but, um, yeah, it's definitely something that I thought could be a good um, inclusion in this topic. Um, so... Um, yeah, we'd love to have everyone join us for our next webinar. It's on, uh, at 11 a.m. on the 25th of July. So I'll be joined by uh, Ramona, who heads up our content development team, um, and we'll be talking about um, off-the-shelf versus bespoke learning products. So we're really uh, looking forward to having that chat too. Um, if there is anything that anybody would like to um, see in a future webinar, we're always on the lookout for new topics to share. So we'd love for you to reach out to us and let us know what's exciting and um, of interest to you and we can rally our troops and see if we can get someone um, really fun to come and chat to you about it. Um, uh, there's a there's another recommendation from Judy Man made by Tracy Spicer. It's an also also an interesting read on AI. So thanks for that, Judy. Um, and then that leads us into um, just asking what a what is one of your key takeaways from today's session. So please share that um, in the chat. Um, or if there's any other questions that you have for Damien and myself, you're welcome to also pop them in there. Um, but yeah, Damien, I think this is a topic we could talk about, um, especially the trends in um, in what's happening out there in the marketplace. It's something I think we could talk about all day. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's, it's the key takeaway for me, Katie, is, is the customization um, and relevancy. So whatever whatever it is that you want to you educate people on, how do you make sure that it's fit for purpose? So it's got to suit not only your company or your organisation, but also suit the person's role. So making sure that that's, uh, accurate and and useful, uh, and then that that it's delivered in the right voice. So the tone, the humour, whatever it might be, that is in line with your organisation. And then once you've got that, how do you actually put that across in an equal way across your workforce, given hybrid working and all those other challenges? So they're they're the key things. Make sure it's make sure it's fit for purpose, and then make sure that you can deliver it across the whole organisation in a way that is equitable uh, to make sure you get the engagement. Oh, thanks, Damien. That's great.
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We've got a few comments in here. So Monica said her the pace and evolution of learning, training and assessment space um, because said his takeaway was uh, using your LMS to it to its best ability. So that's a good one. Um, Poonam said uh, micro learning and industry or organization is relevant. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Poonam. Um, and Dan, how we can produce effective bite-sized learning that is, engages the learner like that. That is just the hottest topic at the moment. Um, like that's another one that we could talk about all day. But, uh, but yeah, thank you everyone for your time. Um, and if you've got any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, here are our details. Um, yeah, I'll, we can, um, we can share our contact details if anyone wants to reach out and reach out to myself or Damien, you're, you're very welcome. But uh, I hope you all have a fantastic Wednesday. Oh, I thought it was Thursday. Um, and, yeah, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Damien. Thanks for having me, Katie, and thank you for everyone for attending. Appreciate it. Thank you.